Hello, everybody. This is another session of the Visual Tools Group. And today we'll have a session about OZ, uh, this tool by Christopher Small, who will present it in a moment. And uh, this group is a group that meets about once a month to discuss collaborations and updates about tooling in closure. And um, maybe uh, we will begin by introducing ourselves briefly and then we'll go about the main part. And then we'll, at the end, we'll have some discussion. Um, uh, uh, Richie, is it okay? Would you tell a bit about yourself? Yeah, hi, uh, I'm Richie, Richie Sai. Uh, I just recently graduated, uh, got my PhD, uh, and uh, I use a lot of closures uh, for my work, and I actually use Oz as well for, for visualization. Um, appreciate the work, by the way. Uh, uh, before that, I was looking for, I think I was using Encanter a very long time ago, and then the thing just uh, kind of come dead, and then I was just searching for a long time for, for actually a useful one, and I found Oz. Thank you very much. Um, um, yeah, so I think closure uh, list. I mean, I'm 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 not just uh, into closure. I'm into list in general. Uh, and I think at this point, closure is probably the uh, the most viable, the most practical one, just because it's connected to the JVM, has access to so many um, tools, libraries, and and also it also. I would say it's a little bit more updated version of a uh, Lisp that has, you know, um, use all all three kind of different version of uh, parentheses, right? Curly brace, bracket, and uh, and the regular parentheses, uh, which is very useful. Make it very useful. Uh, very uh, much easier to read than the the common Lisp. Um, but um, so I, I enjoy using Clojure a lot, and I think uh, the 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 process, you know, the uh, the ripple development process is extremely, extremely powerful, uh, underrated, and also closure the uh, the concurrency aspect of it. That's what I also the other reason I I, I like the most. Um, a lot of my my previous PhD uh, research work are re evolving, like uh, developing this concurrent algorithm. Um, so so that everything out together. Um, so I, I do have a. I I, I think uh, for past uh, eight nine years, it just uh, I just learn everything on myself, and uh, I don't know anybody in person that that do closure. I, I try to kind of uh, get a few people around me, none of them able to pick it up. <laughs> so it's kind of a. So right now I find this community everybody able to come every week to discuss uh, various topics. I'm just very interested in. Um, and also, I recently started working at the, you know, my my new job is actually as a closure developer, and uh, and I'm the only one in the company doing uh, a, a small, a, a kind of a core project of that is written in, in closure, and I'm looking to probably get some of my team members educated. So I mean, some of the I think some of the session here is related with uh, how to teach, how to, you know, uh, showing uh, people how to pick it up, and that could be useful as well, right? So, um, yeah, so that's my, my, my background. Beautiful, thank you so much. And by the way, uh, Richie is also involved in a, a new group where we will be discussing TensorFlow and using TensorFlow, the TensorFlow from Clojure, and maybe it is something we'll discuss in the near future, I hope. Um, yeah. yeah, thanks. And uh, maybe I'll tell about myself. Uh, I'm Danielle. I do statistics. I have a quick question. Oh, Which yeah. group is that? It doesn't have a name yet. It has a okay. stream. Uh, like but a yeah, thank you. Group. Okay, yeah, cool. so That's none great. of the, the groups with names, but we cool. will chat offline, maybe meet sometimes, and use uh, TensorFlow from Clojure. And yeah, yeah that sounds really cool. Yeah. And so I, 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 uh, I'm mostly involved in community building nowadays, and uh, I'm hoping to, I'm about to begin a certain series of workshops or a course for data science uh, enclosure. And then in the coming few weeks, my hope is to determine 
how to use the tooling, how to decide of all the options. And that is why I'm really looking to be affected by this session about OS, hopefully to kind of connect to it uh, back after some time. And Paul, would you tell about yourself briefly? Uh, yeah, I got into closure because I was interested in language development. Uh, I mostly do web dev, but I've done some other interesting things. I've done some stuff with constraint solving, um, uh, floating point based constraint solving and integer base, which is like what most constraint solving is. Uh, I've used Instaparse to help write a language in Clojure. And other other than that, I mainly just do web dev stuff. Um, so that's me. Thank you so much. Uh, Kira, uh, will you tell a bit? Yeah, hi, so I'm Kira. Um, yeah, also I guess mostly my involvement with this community is like community building on the community building side. Um, I, yeah, I write closure for a living. I work with a company called Swirl and we publish open data. So mostly I build like um, data publishing tools for various UK government agencies, although I'm in Canada. Um, and yeah, I guess, yeah, I'm currently, like I mentioned, looking to find some sort of like container or notebook tool to um, publish this uh, like closure data content um, examples and tutorials and stuff like that. And so I'm really curious about, yeah, Oz and Clerk and all the other viable ones and curious, like, like I said, to find something that's going to be um, like, it's, it's hard to find something that's good for, for both like purposes, like easy to publish and easy to navigate and use and like read as a book, but then also like a useful like software um, environment. So like something that you can copy paste examples from and actually run them and something that you can somehow test the examples that are in it and stuff like that. So there are like obviously a million um, solutions out there for publishing like a static website, like publishing a bunch of content as a book on the internet. I'm hoping to find something that's like a little bit more on the literate programming side of the spectrum, but not like so far that it looks terrible. Um, anyway, yeah, so super curious about this. I'm excited for this this next hour. And uh, anyway, it's it's a very slow ongoing project. Like I said, I'm trying to find my way towards some way to like maybe take a day or two off a week from work and do this instead. But for now, it's just like a little part-time uh, hobby pace type of thing. But uh, yeah, anyway, that's me. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Then uh, Christopher, maybe you would like to present yourself in a moment and then we'll just go about diving in into O's. And probably we could make it a little less than an hour and then we leave some time at the end to kind of broaden the picture and talk about the big picture. And yeah, so would you tell about yourself? Yeah, uh, nice to meet everyone. Uh, I'm Chris and um, yeah, I, uh, I build tools for um, deliberative engagement uh, as kind of part of my day job. And um, it was uh, very, very initial uh, wanderings into that space that, uh, that led me to closure about 10 years ago now already. And um, I was just sort of fallen more and more in love with it ever since. And to me, um, you know, the reason I'm here is that um, I feel pretty strongly that, you know, closure is, if not one of, is maybe the best, uh, or let's say at least has the most potential out there for, um, for languages as far as a data science um, sort of ecosystem. Um, and that really comes down to kind of at, in a nutshell, it's, um, it's data-driven philosophy. I think that sort of obviously data-driven programming methodology and, and, um, and data science kind of feel like they go hand in hand. And, um, just a lot of the ways that closure has been so brilliantly designed to think of well uh, let me let me stop from waxing poetic here i think we all know we all know uh, why we like closure but um um yeah so it, you know as part of that um uh you know living in an ecosystem that is still kind of young um uh like to be able to kind of contribute back to that um so i built a few different tools in in my time that kind of touch on the space one was semantic csv which is like a 
CSV processing library back in the day. Um, I think now that's somewhat been um, uh, uh, a, a lot of that, those kind of needs are now being covered by things like TechML data set and, um, uh, but it is still a library that's out there. But um, uh, many years ago uh, now already uh, started um, uh, getting into working with um, Vega Lite and Vega, um, which I'd come across actually first um, way back when, um, uh, when Gorilla uh, notebooks uh, were, were a thing, uh, Gorilla Rebel, and um, was, uh, was just a really cool project and had, had all kinds of interesting things going on. But one of the things that caught me was that the visualization layer was in this Vega grammar. And, and at the time I looked at it and Vega seemed like this kind of big, huge thing. It was really interesting and kind of, uh, you know, visualization as a value um, and kind of felt like it was very in line with the, the closure philosophy. Um, but it was just kind of too verbose for like day-to-day -day data visualization. Um, and I had seen that the, the folks who were working on it who were actually here in Seattle at the, the Interactive Data Lab, uh, I saw that they um, had this other project, Vega Lite, which was supposed to be more for like day-to-day -day data science work, just really quick, high leverage um, visualization uh, library with the same kind of, you know, visualization as a data specification kind of um, uh, API and, and flow. And, um, but at the time when I kind of checked it out, it was still too, too nascent. It wasn't, wasn't quite developed enough. And, um, uh, you know, years later, uh, I kind of started exploring it again and realized that they'd come out with version 2.0 and like all the problems with the way the things composed or, you know, whatever. And, and so the first iteration had been resolved. And I mean, it was just the stuff that you could do with it just blew me away. And so I instantly wanted to start using this. Um, uh, and um, there, at the time, there was um, there was a little library that uh, that kind of you know had had a, um, let's see what was it called um, Vizard, um, which um, was was just very simple. It was just a REPL tool for visualizing, um, you know, for for displaying visualizations in a web browser. Um, so it had a web socket, and you know, it would send these visualizations and and visualize them. And um, and and this was made possible by the fact that the the Vega and Vega Lite data visualizations are just data specs, right? So it was really easy to just take a specification, send it over the wire to the front end, have it render it, and you know, you're know you done, right? Um, and so this was really beautiful that, you know, again, by to this kind of data-driven philosophy, you now have this tooling in JavaScript, this, this, this Vega Lite stuff, um, and, and Vega that you could use from, um, from really any programming language. And that's, so that, that, that really appealed to me. And again, the way that that kind of beautiful demonstration of the closure philosophy of, you know, uh, it's all just data, right? Um, so, uh, so yeah, so I started working with that and um, uh, realized that there were some things I wanted to do that you couldn't do in Vega Lite, that you actually needed the full Vega to do. Um, the original author wasn't interested in, um, in adding Vega support, kind of considered it wasn't, wasn't his bag. And so I forked the project and started working on it and realizing, oh, you know, maybe we could add hiccup in here as well as kind of an additional layer for composing visualizations and other potentially other user interface or reporting kind of stuff. And um, <laughs> before you know it, I've, this whole project has snowballed and now I don't even know what the thing is. We'll talk about that a little bit more later, but, um, but that's, that's kind of where we're at now. Um, the project has evolved considerably over the years um, as you kind of get to now, okay, now you've got hiccup, right? So you're pretty close to like sort of a static content generator now. Well, like, well, let's let's actually build that into something that watches files and and um, and can be used to like do live coding of of a website, like a static website, a blog, or something, um, or 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 even kind of a notebook kind of workflow. Um, and uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is kind of. Um, a little bit of where that evolution has led to, um, but also um, uh, as um, uh, as Daniel pointed out, how 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 I see it being used in sort of a more flexible uh, capacity, as uh, you know, uh, from from a developer perspective, from the perspective of someone who's wanting to take the tool and kind of do something that's maybe a little outside of its wheelhouse, but actually they use it almost as a library or as a component in some bigger system. Um, and so those two things kind of feed off of each other because it's the most recent kind of developments in what Oz sees itself as and what it's trying to be that they kind of lead to um, properly understanding like what the extensibility um, mechanisms will look like for Oz and, and, and so on. So, um, so again, going to kind of start off and talking about Oz as a data sync processing um, 
framework and then get into extending it and, um, and, and how you do that. Um, and then hopefully get feedback from folks um, about what they what what they think about this direction whether they have ideas is this bad is this good um what you know what other things are, are we not thinking about here um and so um yeah if there's no questions right now i'll go ahead and go ahead and dig in so the first thing uh to really point out is <laughs> that i i every time i talk about oz i'm like never quite sure how to describe it. i kind of started talk, describing it as like a swiss army knife which is kind of true because it is this tool where Again, you can you could really do a lot with it. You can use it just to still at the REPL to um, you know create a data visualization, plug some data into it, and visualize it, and you know now you're done. Um, or you can build a whole static site with it. I mean, right? There's all this sort of stuff that it can do, and so it's it's been really hard for me to like capture like a, a nice package like what actually is Oz, right? And I think that really what it's turning into is async data processing toolkit. Um, and that means a lot of these other things, right? But, um, but you know, the, the pithiest way I think I could put it is an, it's an engine for processing and visualizing code, documents, data, et cetera, right? With, it, with hopefully at least an extensible, uh, extensible um, execution model. So um, what this looks like and what this actually means is um, everything in Oz is kind of broken down into, um, well, it, everything's going to be, um, kind of built around a core function, which is process. Um, and process is gonna be something that can take sort of an arbitrary set of instructions about what it's supposed to process and then kind of do the thing. And the thing comes down to two steps. One is a static pre-process step, which um, it's your initial static compilation of whatever assets are coming in. So if it's closure code, it's uh, um, you know, it's analyzing the code, breaking it into code blocks, um, figuring out dependencies between those blocks, figuring out dependencies between those blocks and other namespaces, et cetera. And, um, and then um, after that initial processing um, and execution phase, and this is, this is where things become async um, and um, where we take advantage of all the dependencies that we've analyzed, et cetera, and are able to, um, to execute things in order and then kind of fully update um, whatever the sort of processing flow that we're working on is. So some of the, what this kind of means is that some of the things that this potentially encapsulates or covers are kind of the, the tasks of what you might traditionally call like a workflow manager or workflow tool in kind of a bioinformatics or, you know, in some kind of parts of the data science space. Um, so I'm trying to remember some of the names of these things. Um, there's like snake make or you know there's a bunch of these things that exist in like python and, and other languages um uh it it also kind of exists as a build tool um which i mean some, there's overlap between those things too right back, back when i was at fred Hutch cancer research center was kind of how i got into um data science doing bioinformatics stuff um it was um we didn't we were actually using SCONS, which is this make replacement written in Python, um, usually used for building software, but we had sort of repurposed it for building um, bioinformatic analyses because it actually has a lot of things that are really nice. You can track, um, you know, hashes input files and, and keeps track of the commands that you're, whether they've changed, um, whether the files have changed and sort of does a pretty good job of only running what needs to get rerun had a lot of constraints that sort of born out of the fact that it was really focused on building software and that that's why it had been built. Um, but we were really able to do a lot with it. A lot of advantages of using this kind of tool for, um, for orchestrating um, analyses. Um, I'm getting, a, I don't know if you can see it, but my computer is saying my internet connection is unstable. So uh, try to holler something if, if, if I cut out here. Um, but- um, uh, By the way, uh, you're not sharing the screen. Did you mean to share the screen? Oh. <laughs> oh, of course I'm not. Oh, I'm yeah. so sorry. I, we've only missed a couple slides here. It was mostly just uh, rambling, but yeah, let me go ahead and uh, let me go ahead and uh, and share that. Oh my God. Uh, um. Okay. So here, just to say that we did right. So hacking Oz. Oz is data sync, um, data processing, extending. This is where we're going. That's the roadmap. Um. And again, just a, this is kind of the evolution of how I think of Oz as um, an engine for processing and visualizing code, documents, data. Um, and again, here's the kind of breakdown for this process kind of 
core of the system um, breaks down to a, into a pre-process phase and an execution phase. Um, this is something I'll be talking about a little bit more here, um, but just wanted to get that visually for folks because I think it is kind of key to understanding um, the model um, and, and um, which is in turn important to understand if you want to think about extending Oz or kind of your use of it. Oh, sorry, let me get, okay, yeah, that's good. Um, so anyway, it was going through here, you know, it's also kind of a workflow manager, a build tool, but also um, has potential to be kind of a runtime with an ID like feedback loop, right? So, so if you have watching code and, and evaluating as you save changes, um, there's a lot that you get uh, that's that's kind of similar to what you'd have from an IDE, right? Where um, as as you run or as you update things, you're able to see which uh, chunks of code are failing, um, what what's the stream of that that might also be failing or uh, from running it. Um, uh, recently, we had some ideas about uh, looking for um, test uh, definitions in your source code and using that to do some kind of aggregation at the end of your files to say this many tests have passed or whatever and and um you know imagine just having this system where you write the code you save the files you see the tests pass um and you don't even really have to like go and manually execute them because it's actually looking at the graph the dependency graph of all the blocks of code and seeing which tests need to get run or which don't um uh, and, and again potentially able to do that in parallel Um, but it's still a data visualization and exploration tool. So, you know, there's still that. And again, it's still kind of this thing that's, that has, um, you know, notebook environment like um, potential and has been increasingly like improving in its capacity there. Um, so as is within this, within this, um, this paradigm as an async uh, processing toolkit. Um, but now to kind of break down this execution model in a little bit greater detail. Again, kind of going over the execution model here. Um, the first thing that happens is a pre-processing step. Um, and this is um, to kind of give some motivation for why, why we care about any of this. Um, one of the things that um, I realized as I was working on kind of the, not this latest tranche of work, but even a little bit before that, I was a of um, doing the initial work on making things um, uh, run in parallel and everything was that we actually want, right, we don't want to have to wait until a file has fully, um, fully finished running to start displaying anything, right? It was, it was really annoying to me with the, with the earlier sort of, you know, one point whatever iterations of Oz that um, if you had a file that had a lot of analysis going on, you literally had to wait until the entire thing was complete to get any kind of feedback to see, you know, I mean, even, even if you're just changing some of your, um, uh, some of your markdown in a notebook file, you know, but the, um, uh, the, the way that I had set things up in, in Oz 1.0 is a very simple assumption about code changes. Um, only things after your first code change get rerun, right? And so if you're going in and changing a body of text in the middle of a code file, you're having to reevaluate the entire file, right? Um, and any you know, computational steps that come after that. So where you're doing a lot of heavy work, that led to a really poor feedback loop. Um, and it was always obvious to me that like, I'm just updating some markdown here. <laughs> like I don't need to rerun everything. This is ridiculous. Um, and so one of the, one of the key things that I really wanted to have happen next iteration is for this, obviously, like I should be getting results and feedback as thing and, um, a kind of key consequence of that is that you need to have something to render right off the bat. Um, and so, um, the process, the pre-processing step in, in the Oz process model is really about 
building up um, your initial view of the data. Uh, that, sorry, um, you're right. You're, you're taking in some kind of data, whether it's markdown or closure or you know or whatever kind of assets, and you're going to be coming up with some hiccup representation of them, right? So, um, so in the case of code, say. Um, or even Markdown that has code sort of embedded within it, you're going to need some initial view of that code. And so where things are still getting processed um, asynchronously, where code's still being evaluated, we're going to use these, um, well, and, and we do now use these Oz async block um, hiccup elements, which represent something that hasn't completed yet, right? So now these async blocks, they can actually have content associated with them, right? So that you can start displaying something. So for instance, for, um, for a code block from, from a closure file, you're gonna want to display that code. Um, and uh, you know, on, on, the, on the live view, we actually display something that tells you how long that code is taking to evaluate, it has a little ticker when it's done, um, you know, that, that checks off. Um, but um, uh, in addition, to well, yeah. So, so, so the first goal is really to, to generate this sort of initial view with these uh, async blocks for places where there's something that we still have work to do on, right? Um, but additionally, uh, the pre-processing phase comes down to, to the analysis required to what the dependencies are between namespaces, um, the dependencies between blocks of code, so that we can execute them in the right order, um, and. Uh, Um, uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm writing implementations now that are kind of abstracting this away from uh, the assumption that you're dealing with closure code, which um, turns out is, <laughs> it's, been, it's been a little more work than I'd hoped, but um, uh, uh, the, the goal is for that to be extensible to implement it on kinds of data or other kinds of code. Um, and it's one of my goals to be able to to execute, for example, you know, this kind of model. Um, although obviously we, we won't be able to do quite as much with dependencies and, and requires there, because I think analyzing arbitrary code is going to get a little bit more complicated with the other languages um, that are sort of thing. But um, but I you know I think there's still potential in, in, in that space. Um, so anyway, kind of take, again, we're supposed to be focusing on execution model here. So the pre-processing step, again, it's the static phase, right? We're coming up with some static representation of whatever it is that we want to visualize, um, whatever kind of document we're working with. Um, and, and there's going to be these that have stuff that needs to get, um, that needs to get uh, processed uh, asynchronously. Um, so once we've got that initial view, um, we update a live view synchronous results. Um, so once that's happened, we go into the execution mode. And in the execution mode, these asynchronous blocks are processed um, in parallel. I should have put that there. Um, and as updates complete, they're sent to the live view. Um, so once all of those asynchronous blocks completed, now we fall back in a case, for example, where you don't really have, right, where the live view isn't quite good enough because you're, say, updating, a, you're writing to a PDF. Um, that's something that, um, or, or even actually if you are just writing to HTML, but for your, your final static HTML document, you want that to be, um, you know, you, you need all the actual content before you write that. You can't just have these asynchronous blocks in there. Um, and so, um, so this is kind of this breakdown between pre-processing and the execution phase is really what allows you to have um, the live view that gives you constant feedback on what your um, uh, what your what kind of document you're working with, what you're visualizing. Um, so this is maybe just because. Well, actually, let me let me let me go through this just a little bit, and then uh, Chris, like that, maybe um, maybe it is a good point to stop for a moment. The your voice is kind of lagging sometimes, and maybe you could try to disconnect and connect again, and maybe it would make things better. It, I think it is worth trying to have this stop for a moment. Is it okay? Yeah, sure. 
yeah thanks and maybe maybe we'll all close the video i i'm not sure i'm never sure but maybe it would kind of <laughs> yeah yeah let me see if i um Okay, so um, I was actually on my 2.4 gigahertz um, router setting. Um, I'm on the five now, which sometimes, in theory, that should be faster, but also sometimes the signal is weaker. So we'll see how this goes. Um, yeah, yeah, let us try. try. And reconnecting too. Let me let me go ahead and try that. Okay, cool. Uh, can you still hear me? Yeah, wonderful. Great. Uh, let's let's uh, yeah, let's go ahead and give give it another shot. Uh, pull up my slides again. Okay, here we go. Um, screen um yeah great so uh so yeah i actually do th i was thinking the same thing daniel that this is actually a pretty good time to stop for questions but let me um let me just say a couple more things real quick uh that kind of fully flesh things out a little bit more um so the dependencies are mediated uh by this oz block id um, which is a hash based on the source of whatever block you're, you are currently on and all of its dependencies. Um, and so again, the analysis step is something that's kind of abstracted and which among other things returns a set of dependencies um, as other block IDs. And then when we're computing this quote unquote uh, current block ID, uh, that, that ends up being a, um, you know, derived based on its dependency block IDs, as well as whatever source and stuff it has. So that if anything changes, either upstream that it depends on or the actual source for whatever we're currently looking at, then that will get updated. Um, but it also tracks um, namespaces and other potentially at least um, file or document level constructs. Um, and, and the goal here is for the kinds of docs or blocks which can be processed to be extensible. So that um, so that this model isn't closed, and you know uh, only the things that Oz has been programmed to know about or deal with um, can be dealt with in this manner. But really, that you potentially be able to add your own definitions here, so that um, you can kind of build workflows that capture whatever your imagination can possibly conjure up. Um, so just because it's easier to talk about things from this slide, I think I'm going to take a step back um, and go ahead and open open the floor for questions here. Uh, so most of your work has been done with doing this sort of dependency analysis and I guess partial evaluation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah, I, let's see. Where has most of my work gone? Um, so uh, for the initial kind of pass that, um, I mean, right now, this is actually maybe a good time to take a step back and say um, where the project as a whole is right now. Um, right now, I've, um, unfortunately, Oz has been in sort of a weird state for a while. I had, um, I had very high aspirations last time I talked about Oz that within a few months or so, I'd be releasing a, a non-alpha 2.0 release and, um, and that, uh, you know, we'd see Oz 2.0 coming into the world, um, 
you know, more sort of fully within, you know, within a few months. Um, of course, fast forward and we had a war um, my, in Ukraine, sadly. Um, my, my parents, uh, my family was involved in um, the, the wildfires in New Mexico, um, largest in history this year. Um, and so I went down there to help them. Um, then I was traveling with my family for a while. So I'm, I'm coming off of a, a lot of stuff happening this year um, and have not had as much time to dedicate to this project as I'd hoped. Um, so one, one of the reasons I'm going through all this in kind of detail is that um, if it can be, uh, you know, I, I'd love to be able to get more folks involved in helping kind of flesh a lot of these things out. And I mean, I, I think I'm getting close now to taking the work that I did um, back the last time I talked about Oz um, with, uh, with the kind of advances in notebook functionality and asynchronous slash parallel code execution um, and, and really generalize them uh, because uh, right now, if you use the 2.0 branch, um, there are definitely some things that are broken, right? So to get, to get everything working for the, um, for the code execution um, side of things, there were aspects of processing, say, markdown files and, and other stuff that, um, that unfortunately, were, unfortunately were broken. And my goal was just to keep, you know, keep working on that alpha branch and, and getting things um, pumped out. But um, again, this year has just been a little more challenging than anticipated. Um, so I kind of left a note in, um, and here I'll actually, uh, so right now, if you go to um, Metasaurus Oz, um, there should be, oh, did I not? Oh, I guess I didn't push it. <laughs> okay, well, I, I was supposed to have pushed, um, here, let me see, maybe can I push that now? Oh, I thought I thought I did it in browser. Well, whatever. Um, I, I I wrote somewhere and have not yet pushed um, a, a note at the bottom here under the the versions that kind of indicates um, what the current status of things is. Um, but basically, if you want to use something that's stable, use the one point six point something version, and I'll have that hard coded in here. Um, and if you want to test out some of the new asynchronous slash parallel processing functionality, um, then, then go ahead and check out the, the, the 2.0 build, but just know that it is more alpha than the, than the 1.6 version um, currently is. So um, let's see, where are we? Back here. Okay, fun stuff. Um, uh, yeah, so to answer your question, what I've been working on since then has really been about um, kind of exactly that hang up. The fact that um, when I moved to this 2.0, um, there were things that kind of had to get tweaked a little bit in order to evaluate things um, for, for code. Um, and now I'm kind of going back and abstracting that work. And basically this entire scheme that I'm showing you here um, is in the process of being abstracted from the work that I did, getting things to process the closure code uh, asynchronously and in parallel. Um, so does that kind of answer your question here? Uh, yeah. So you said, um, you're like watching Markdown and compiling Markdown files as well. Yes. Yeah. Uh, is that, is that done via something like a plugin architecture or is that sort of a integrated into the library? Yeah, so even in um, version 1.6, that does exist. Um, so if you go to the most recent 1.6 release, uh, you can ingest Markdown. Um, currently, in well, yeah, so in the 1.6 release, you cannot evaluate code in Markdown, um, but you can um, you can embed Vega visualizations um, using um, uh, using class annotations when you do. This is a little hard to, maybe I could type some out later if you're interested, but um, if you do the tick, tick, tick style of code uh, embedding in a markdown file, um, if you know what I mean, um, you can stop me if you don't, um, you'll, you may be familiar with the model of on the first tick, 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 you could put CLJ or JS or, you know, some, some extension to notate what language you're working with, what language the code is in. Um, well, there's a, there's a, an additional, if you put space, I think it's eval, um, that might be changed to execute here to kind of match execute here. Um, then that will actually execute the code as say a Vega light spec or, um, 
uh, in the future that'll execute potentially closure or closure script, um, maybe a Skittle or, or, or whatever, and, and potentially other languages, right? So if you'd like to embed some R in your, in your data science notebook or some Python, um, you should be able to do that as well. Um, so yeah, right now there is some limited support for Markdown, but again, it doesn't, um, in 1.6, it doesn't actually evaluate any code other than, other than Vega or Vega Lite. Um, but in the, in the 2.0 release, um, that should be able to uh, execute other kinds of code as well. Is there any, anything, um, special you're doing with that, uh, or, uh, do you expect the code to be in a form where there's no magic happening? Like, uh, so a lot of, a lot of, uh, readmes and stuff. They'll just show code snippets, and in one of the snippets, they'll have the namespace like required, but in all the other ones, they won't. Or are you just not dealing with that type of weird code? Um, let's see. So you mean in in a Markdown file? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So I think the way that that'll work in a Markdown file is kind of like it would work in a REPL. Um, if your file doesn't have a namespace um, declaration, then I think everything would just get populated in the user namespace. Uh, no, no, I mean like uh, in a lot of readmes, uh, especially mm -hmm. for closure, yeah. there'll be one code snippet in the file that does a require for the namespace and then oh, none of the other yes. code snippets will use it. So do right. you have like, is this that style that you're, that you're aiming for, or you want it to be like actual copy and paste in whatever code block the code is expected to be copy and pasted, and there's no like references to other previous code blocks, or is it going to be more like literate programming where the whole Markdown file is considered like a single namespace? Yes, more more the latter. I mean, you could potentially write a markdown file that had multiple namespaces. Um, there should actually be nothing wrong with that. Uh, but yes, it would be implicit that if at the very top of your if if the first code block in your um, in your markdown file, say again, like a readme as you mentioned, it has a namespace declaration in it, then everything after that would fall within that namespace. So yeah, everything is going to be treated as though you stripped out all the code um, from your markdown file, or at least any code that has an exec annotation on it, and you know, ran that file as a regular code file. Yeah. Uh, so are you, I'm curious, uh, are you using uh, a dependency to do that? Because I've actually seen that before. Yeah, I don't know what the thing I saw was, but it was related to like literate programming for tests. Yeah, yeah, uh, there are there is some stuff like that. Um, that that hadn't occurred to me that there was some similar work going on there. But but yeah, that's actually one of the things that uh, again, like I want to do more in Oz to actually make testing of kind of first class consideration because I think that'll make it insanely more useful as a um, as a general purpose programming tool. Um, but uh, yeah, so there's probably some similar stuff going on there. I don't know. I, I think I know the project you're talking about. There may, there may even be a couple of them now. Um, I don't know what they're using to do it, but yeah, my guess is it's pretty similar. Um, what I'm doing right now is um, literally just using uh, the, I think it's um, Yagthos's Markdown processor. I think that's right. Um, uh, and um, what happens is when those code blocks come out, all those little annotations come out as classes on that code block, um, you know, represented as hiccup. And so we look for those class annotations that it parses out uh, in order to figure out how we're going to interpret those blocks of code. So then once we've taken those blocks of code, you know, we can pass them through the Oz reader and it can do all of its work, you know, um, well, again, going it goes to the pre-processing step to figure out what namespaces are required, um, what the dependencies are, blah, 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 right? Yeah, I, I have to look into 
that I use some of his other libraries. Uh, I didn't know there was a Markdown one. Uh, what's so I've done I've done some work with uh, like making a a language. Actually, I made a I did something in Instaparse where I compiled Excel spreadsheets into closure code. Mm -hmm. And one of the issues I had was dealing with the dependencies because yeah. uh, Excel is a what do you call it? It's like um, the lines don't execute in order. It's an out of order execution model. Mm -hmm. So I have to figure out the order to execute things in. Um, right. So I'm sort of like, this is a, that's an easy thing to do um, compared to, I think what you're doing. So I'm interested in the, the issues you've run into with like cutting up these files and uh, figuring out how to deal with the dependencies, especially with async stuff. Yeah, yeah. And I um, I could have probably said more about that here. One thing I want to make be clear about is that um, it is um, th like this, this is certainly a little bit, ex at least a little bit experimental, right? Um, and potentially fraught with peril. Um, now, I don't want to scare you too badly, uh, because I think that one of our real advantages here, and I think this goes very strongly in, um, in the corner of uh, support for Clojure's approach to paradigming, uh, sorry, <laughs> Clojure's uh, approach to, uh, to programming. Um, and in particular, it's, it's, you know, it's emphasis on pure functional programming is that we don't have a lot of mutations. Um, there are some kind of key language constructs that do require mutation. Um, in particular, every time we use a multi-method, right, we are mutating some state somewhere. Um, we like to think of like, okay, sure, this is part of our kind of pure functional programming paradigm, but the reality is every time we call a def method, um, we're changing the way that this function works. And so we need to think about that when we're analyzing our code and figuring out what the actual dependencies are. Um, and the reality is we're, ne we're not going to get that right all the time. It's just not possible. Um, I mean, you can even kind of, <laughs> I mean, I think you should be able to prove at some level that, you know, without running, uh, unless you're in some kind of really strictly typed language that, you know, is doing like, has provers and solvers and stuff built into it. Um, uh, um, there's only so much you can do to say with absolute confidence that, that some code is not going to mutate anything. Um, uh, Christopher, I'll stop you for a moment. Um, sure. uh, it would be good to continue uh, like uh, for about uh, 15 minutes uh, with Oz, and then we'll kind of broaden the picture. And uh, maybe it would be good to share some code and just get a, a, a little look into the source code, just a thought. Yeah, yeah, we do that. Um, yeah, so um, just to kind of wrap up the my response to that question. Um, we look at things that we know we're going to see um, to try to catch, you know, the biggest the biggest edge cases. So, in particular, again, if we see a def method, that's something explicitly that we look at and say, okay, well, there's a mutation going hap happening here. So, anything that uses this uh, multi method after this block now depends on this block, right, within a given namespace, um, uh, because, right, like we, we wouldn't want to evaluate something that used that def method until that 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 method has been added um, by a def method. Um, and then similarly, right, we don't want to evaluate uh, the def method until the def multi has been, has been evaluated. Um, and we, we do similarly for, we look for calls to swap or, um, or reset for atoms. So you should be able to use atoms in your, um, in your Oz notebooks um, and have, have it kind of pick up on the fact that um, you know, this, this block depends on this because of the way that things are mutating here. Um, but if you're trying to write, you're probably going to come up, come up with problems if you're trying to write code that is, you know, like what you might write in say Python or, or JavaScript or wherever, where you're creating an array and then mutating it, um, in place. We don't write that kind of code very often. So, um, I, like, I don't think that it's a huge deal for us the way it would be in other languages, but, um, the one thing uh, I will I'm, say is that there's ways of specifying um, that blocks actually depend on each other. 
um, oh, okay. or, or that um, or that you want a block to be sort of run synchronously so that everything up until here will get run um, and then this block will run and then it'll run everything else. Um, uh, maybe before can, and after. Can I ask uh, kind of one? So you, you, you sound like, it sounds like you're uh, doing this based off of like parsing um, as opposed to like watching certain things, like watching the, the multi-method object thing that's the enclosure or, or watching the um, hierarchy weird thing enclosure or watching uh, the atoms. Did you, did you run into problems with, with something like that? You know, uh, it's something that I thought a lot about. Um, and unfortunately it's, um, I think it, it it might actually be worth doing some kind of um, inspection to see, you know, okay, look, this this thing has been reevaluated. Um, let's you know, let's take it to the next step or whatever. Um, but there are some problems with that. So, in particular, and I'm trying to remember all the details of this. This is a little fuzzy now, but um, it's not always the case. For example, that when you reevaluate, uh, say, a function definition, like define blah, 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 some function, yada, 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 right? You might be able to add a listener to that var. Um, I know you can add listeners to, um, I think you can add listeners to vars, is that right? Um, but certainly you can add listeners to, um, to atoms, say, right? Um, but there's a lot of cases where you know, especially if you have like a function involved, the function definition might be exactly the same, but you're going to get a new function object and there's no way to test it for equality with another function. And sadly, not everything, not every value enclosure sort of knows what its quote unquote source was, right? So it's not always possible to look back and see like what code actually generated this. Do I need to think about this as a new definition of something or is this actually just implicitly going to be the same as it was before? Um, and so actually, um, the, when I kind of reviewed exactly what you're asking about, um, it seemed to me that like sticking to the source and like, is the source actually changing, you know, ignoring white space and stuff, but is the source actually changing was kind of the better predictor for, um, or, you know, the better way of making a decision about actually what needs to get updated. Um, yeah, so hopefully that answers that. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to burn through uh, at least most of these slides um, in the next fifteen or so, and then I'm happy to answer whatever other questions uh, folks have. Um, so this kind of gets us to the extension. Oop. <laughs> just a second. Where am I? Uh, okay, here we go. Yeah, I just need to change the font size a little bit. Um, so this kind of gets us to the extension API. Um, my goal here is to come up with something like a uh, register block type, um, register doc type, a set of, a set of functions that you can call where, you know, you add your custom type name here. And I say type, but this may actually be kindly, um, I've been talking to Daniel a little bit about that. We can discuss that more, uh, in a little bit here if, if folks are interested. Um, but where you'd specify all of these pieces that I'm kind of abstracting away right now. And so th these are some of the key ones that, um, that, may, um, th that may pop up. And you know, these are all gonna be kind of more fully specced out um, uh, soon here. Um, oh, right, I, I'm kind of mixing things up here. I think this was initially written, uh, assuming this was gonna be not block type, but um, uh, actually doc type. So I think parse function, function and analyze function. Um, and um, yeah, at least these two would be for the doc type. Uh, and these three would be for um, the block type. So to clarify what I mean there, a document is some like say a closure file or a markdown file or you know HTML file, but you know something that's a complete package, a complete unit. Um, and then a block is some component within that, right? Um, and so sorry, sorry for mixing that up there, but um, um, yeah, so this idea of a registration function, I think is probably what things will look like. There is some question about, you know, would you actually just have all of these, um, 
mappings between your custom types and their parse functions and you know um, view functions, et cetera. Um, would would you just pass those directly to say your Oz build function? I, I kind of think not, because I think that as as a toolkit, um, you want things to be fast and you don't want to have to be passing around a bunch of these, you know, parsing functions to um, to your build and to your view and to you know all, all the different little toolkit components that Oz has. I mean, oftentimes you do end up kind of just running, or at least I do, uh, end up kind of just running build and then you know using that for everything. Um, but I, I want for you know I want for things to feel nice. So I think there will probably be a registration. Um, it's just a set of registration functions here, and um, that'll be how you can kind of plug into the system and extend it. Um, but one thing I wanted to show uh, just as a demonstration is how sort of extensible Oz is just kind of based on what it has in it right now. And so um, I, uh, I worked up a little Skittle demo here for adding dynamic content using, um, uh, using Skittle, which if you're not familiar, Skittle is uh, one of the one of the brain children of um, prodigious uh, Bork dude um, who wrote the Psy closure, small closure interpreter and built this kind of scripting language thing using it. So you can actually just by adding some script tags, you can define a um, a new script type, which is application x skittle. And if you plop some closure code in there, it will evaluate it um, using Psy, using the small closure interpreter. Um, and so what I did here was just built a little macro, very simple little thing here that takes this pure function Skittle block um, and whatever your source code is. And it you know, spits out this thing that um, you know, adds these annotations, um, sorry, it adds these script dependencies. Um, and then um, and creates a, an X Skittle script. And um, this is something that I don't know if this is going to be kind of the main. Um, well, I guess we could talk about that later. But here, let's just do a little example here because this is this is just so cool to me. So here we've got kind of a gratuitous uh, reagent test, right? So we're requiring reagent dot core, um, reagent dom, defining our atom, uh, our state atom here. Um, here we have a component, uh, displays the current number of clicks, and it has a button which, um, which updates the, the click count using swap. Um, so indeed, this, uh, this does the thing. Now, again, one of the things that's broken in Oz 2.0 is that, and actually, I think Daniel pointed this out to me, is that the, um, the template function and some of the other things are only working in the static compile mode. Um, so that's one of the things that I'm working on fixing right now. So this is actually the static compilation that I'm playing with here. Um, but, uh, but yeah, uh, you can see it does the thing. And this is, this is really cool. I think this opens up a lot of really, really awesome possibilities. Um, so the next thing to talk about really quickly is um, actually what made these slides. Uh, so this is this is the code, actually most of the code that generated these, no, actually I, I updated it all. So this is all the code that generated these slides. Um, what this is doing is it's using the template function feature of Oz. Uh, Oz build isn't the only one that takes it, but that's how I'm using it right now is using this template function. So what this does is um, this, this uh, slideshow that I'm using right now was generated from a closure source file. And we can look at that if, if folks are interested. Um, and what we did was created a custom template that styles these things and gives the functionality of slides. And I can try to go over the code here just really quickly. First, there's a slide view. This just, you know, puts things in a div um, and you put your, yeah, basic simple div. Um, and then we have a function which groups the slides together. Um, and this is basically just um, the, 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 the processing model here is that every time you see an H1 block, um, that is to say, you know, a header, a uh, large header, you start a new slide. Um, and so in my source code for these slides, then every time I want to start a new slide, I just include a head, an H1 tag, um, and everything after that will be included in that slide. Um, and um, yeah, the rest of this code doesn't matter too much, but it's just recurring through and adding things to the last slide if, it, if that's what the right thing to do is and, and starting a new slide if it needs to do that. Um, 
The next thing is um, we add IDs to the slides and you'll see why that's important in a minute, but that's basically just so that you can navigate between slides more easily. Um, and then there's our actual slides template here where we're kind of putting all that stuff together, calling add slide IDs and group slides. Um, and then in build, all that we're doing then to make this happen is just applying this slides template function. Um, and it's then just gonna take all of the code blocks and markdown blocks that it's extracting from comments in our code file. And it's gonna be running through them through this slide template function and plopping everything into the view that it spits out. And again, if we go back up to, where is it here, right? If we go back up here and look at the execution model, um, it's this initial payload that it's going to be generating, right? Like this view that it's generating here is going to be what it spits out from that template function that we just defined, right? So that's that's what's going to get sent to um, both to the browser and to the static compilation. Um, let's see. So what actually um, now you can actually just use page up and page down, and it kind of works, but the there's margins and stuff, so it doesn't quite come out right. And so I actually use Skittle just to define some very basic, I mean, this is probably like not the best code I've ever written. There's a lot of repetition here, but sometimes that's fine. Uh, but this is just a very basic routine, which um, lets me use page down and page up to key in on those, um, on those slide IDs that we were generating up in the step above here. Um, you remember right here, uh, we're adding slide IDs. We're just going through the slide blocks and range. Oh, this is sloppy. I should have deleted that space there. Um, and we're assigning an ID to those block tags um, with slide and then you know the index of where it is. And so in this code, then we just maintain an atom, which is the current page. Um, you know, we're tracking what what keys do what here and um, have a page up function here, which just makes sure that we're never going above zero. Um, and then we use JS document add event listener on key down to look and see if it's any one of the keys that we care about, um, either an up key or a down key or a home key, then we just update our page Adam accordingly. Um, and when any of those keys are pressed, again, this could all probably be a little bit cleaner, but um, when any of those keys are pressed, we prevent the default action. Um, so that we're not kind of getting uh, scrolling down past where we should be. Um, and then finally, uh, we are setting um, the window location hash to the page ID that, um, that, we, uh, that we should be on. And so just uh, with, Chris? yes. Yeah, that is beautiful. Just a, a small question. Yep. This uh, macro called Skittle is a JVM closure macro this whole piece of code is part of your JVM closure namespace, but inside you're actually writing closure script uh, or uh, SCI code in a sense, right? Uh, sorry, can you say that last thing again? Yeah, so inside the macro, you are writing code to be interpreted by the, by, the small closure interpreter running in the browser. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So technically this, all this code is, yeah, I mean, yeah, right. Uh, I love macros. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so all of this code is being evaluated in closure in the JVM. Um, but all that this macro Skittle is doing is taking all the code that you give it. And it's basically just quoting it and sticking it in a script tag and returning that as data. Um, and so again, we can look at that up, um, up here. Uh, so it takes that source code, um, it kind of gloms it together using interpose and apply string um, and sticks it in, in a script tag. And so, yeah, very, very simple, very simple strategy here, but um, I think is uh, is a really cool demonstration of what you can do kind of on a dynamic side um, using using Skittle. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Um, it might be good to, uh, yeah, actually let us see. Uh, could we stay a little longer? Uh, what 
what would people here think? Is, is anybody uh, on a rush to leave soon? Because that's important, I think, <laughs> like a, such an important discussion. I'm not in a rush, so I can, I can stay a little bit longer. Yeah, I can stick around for, for a little bit. Yeah, so, so would it make sense to continue a little, a little bit more with ours and then talk about the big picture, like after maybe 10 more minutes? What do you think? Right. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, and, and this, is, this is wrapping up here. So, um, so coming soon, um, next steps for me are to add back in Markdown and other support. And again, kind of at, finish abstracting and generalizing this, this system that I've been describing. Um, better tracking and hashing of input data files. So I want to create a, um, some kind of demarcation in, um, and basically just to code, uh, you know, a, a function in the API that, um, that tracks things as sort of like data file dependencies, um, sort of, you know, throws that in with the mix. Uh, the ability to extend the notion of running code from other languages. Um, finalize this extension API, um, which is a little bit challenging because there's, um, you know, there are edge cases to consider and, uh, you know, you want to, you don't want to over abstract, um, got to kind of hit the right, the right layer here. And this is, this is, this is a lot of what I've been thinking about and, and working on over the past several months. Um, finally, um, th this is kind of a somewhat wild idea, but, um, I'm really interested in figuring out how to sort of mesh this with like a knowledge base integration so that you could actually have. Oz notebooks that get spit out into Rome research notebooks or, um, or Athens or Logseek or Obsidian or, or Notion, any of these kind of knowledge, um, knowledge based platforms. Um, because I've been using these recently and finding that they're uh, the ability to relate data and, and, and knowledge from different sort of places is a really valuable kind of thing. And having, having things in a knowledge base is, is, um, has a lot of advantages. And so I think that um, figuring out how we can take advantage of that as data scientists um, and have some of these, you know, notebooking and, you know, data workflow kind of tools fit within that paradigm um, is kind of an exciting intersection uh, to explore. Um, so yeah, um, that kind of leads us to some questions, which which I have, um, and which I'm interested in feedback on. We can we can take the discussion in whatever way folks want, but these are some of the things that I'm kind of thinking about right now, and be interested in hearing from folks on. So um, the first is how do we register global live view um, requirements for the live view docs? So uh, this is this is kind of a key to making. Oz really truly extensible. Um, Oz has this challenge where, again, it's it's able to view things both in a live view mode, but also in sort of a static compilation mode, um, and that's just very fundamental to like what Oz is, um, and really the kind of a key to this whole <laughs> this whole process flow that we've been describing with things breaking up into a pre-processing static step and then um, the the execution step where things are being uh, evaluated asynchronously. Um, getting back to this question, how do we register things for the live view side? How do we how do we extend that? Um, one option is just to use this something like this Skittle um, macro. Um, but is there <laughs> Jason? She yes, asked somehow. Um, but is there also a way somehow to do a more traditional closure script compilation in order to get some functionality into the live view so that it knows how to render your custom your custom data type or whatever right um, now to be fair there's a lot that can be done just by using um sorry, sorry just a minute Sorry about that. Um, uh, yeah, so, God, where was I? Um, so, 
Yeah, right. So there's a lot that can be done just by, um, how shall I say this? Um, a lot of the times you don't actually need something different for live view than you do in just a static HTML document. Um, right now, what, what gets spit into a static HTML document for, um, for, um, for say, a Vega light visualization is, um, would probably actually work decently enough for, um, for, for the live, sorry, I think I said that wrong. Yeah, what gets spit out for a static document would actually work decently well enough for, for the live view sort of mode. Um, there's some nice things that you can do if you have um, some closure script running um, where you can look and see um, what is, um, you know, what, what has actually changed here. Can we be a little bit more efficient about what we're recomputing with the Vega, Vega light visualization? I'm also really interested in figuring out are there ways that the front end can, um, and the live view, I mean, uh, can interact with the back end and say, be used as a toggle or control for, um, for, for things that you're doing on the computational side. So like, could you drag um, a selection of data points in, um, in a data visualization and then have it spit out those IDs in the, um, in, in some atom or something on the, the, the Java, the Java, the JVM side. Um, so for things like that, having this ability to register live views that are different from what's getting compiled statically, I think is, I think is valuable. The question is just, how do you do that? Um, uh, is Skittle enough? Do we want to plug in some other kind of closure script compilation, maybe include shadow CLJS as part of the project? Um, uh, I, that, that, that starts to look a lot more complicated. I'm leaning more and more towards like, if you can do it with Skittle, maybe that's the way that we support this kind of thing. Um, but, but maybe there's ideas that other, other folks have about how, how we might do that, that, um, uh, that we could take advantage of. Um, there's a better way to do it. So I'm interested in hearing from folks on that. Um, the next is how to optimize the ecosystem compatibility so that Folks who are using, say, Clerk or Clay or Note Space or I mean any one of these other things out there, um, all be able to kind of share their work, right? So, um, Clerk in particular has kind of a very different assumption about like what's going to get displayed on a page, um, and. I think for good and for bad, Oz has been kind of um, conservative in that you know we decided early on that there's lots of things that you might be playing around with as a programmer. Like if you just type, you know, range, <laughs> um, you're going to get an infinite sequence. And if you tried to display that on the browser, it's going to, you know, you're, you're going to get a crash. Right. Um, and so our approach has been just to say, okay, well, we don't display anything unless you explicitly ask for it. Right. Um, whereas the approach that clerk has taken is, we're going to go through a bunch of work to uh, to kind of paginate through uh, a data structure and show you kind of the head of it. And if you want to see more, we'll kind of click through, um, which is really cool. I mean, I think it's really one of the innovations of um, of the clerk model is that that gets you this system where everything you type in your code notebook is going to be displayed, uh, which is one less step work. Um, for someone who's, you know, doing data science and kind of going through the, 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 the notebook workflow. Um, in Oz, it's kind of required that you actually say, like, I want you to render this by putting it in a hiccup tag, um, which most of the time, I mean, it's, it's, it's not a ton of work, but sometimes you kind of do just wish that um, you, you didn't have to do that. And so some, um, some ways of making it so that you can use alternate um, evaluation, well, ultimate display modes, um, ultimate or alternate assumptions about what's going to get displayed in your output documents, um, I think has, has some value for creating um, um, compatibility between tools. And um, uh, Daniel and I chatted a little bit now about using something like Kindly to describe what kinds of documents or um, you know, input or output types you might be working with. Um, and so we can chat about that a little bit. Um, and then finally, how to negotiate dependencies between code and different languages. 
And obviously this is like not really solvable, but if we're going to have say a markdown file that has chunks of closure code, we can do the same work we're doing right now to analyze that closure code and say, okay, well, we're defining a var here and this next block of code uses that var. So clearly it depends on it and so on. But it, if you sort of imagine yourself in a polyglot scenario where you're writing some closure code to do some data analysis, and then you wanna use a Python library to take that data that you just generated and say run a machine learning algorithm on it uh, that um, you don't want to wrap it with um, libpython clj. You actually just want to write some Python code and get your job done, right? Because that's what's that's what's easiest for you to do. Or you maybe you're working with people who are more comfortable in Python and they actually just want to plop in a Python block and read some data that you wrote out to a file and um, do some work in Python that way. Um, the question is, how do we decide what needs to get run before what when you're working with multiple languages? Um, and I think that um, this is kind of an open question. I mean, um, you might have to just explicitly say, you know, before you run this Python block, make sure that these two closure blocks have finished running because we are going to need the data output from those those blocks. Um, but maybe there's maybe there's more that we could do here, or maybe maybe there's less that we could do. Maybe we should just run. Um, every time we see a Python or some other language block, we make sure that everything prior to it has finished running. So kind of just a very simple dependency model, which assumes that everything before this has to get run before, um, before anything in say Python or, or R or whatever uh, can be run. So a couple, couple different models there that we could potentially look at. Um, or again, if we do a good enough job of abstracting this dependency model that comes out of the analysis step of the pre-processing phase. Um, again, kind of going back to, uh, to, this, to this slide here, right? If we're able to abstract sufficiently this analysis, um, you know, requirement and dependency um, phase of the pre-processing uh, side of things, then perhaps we can come up with, um, we could at least make it extensible so that you could, you could, if you're, you know, if you're wanting to go and customize things and think that you, you have, <laughs> you, <laughs> that you want to do the work of figuring out how to um, define dependencies between chunks of Python code, um, maybe that's something we could actually support and that you could actually do that way. Um, but, um, but it does get very tricky because, uh, analyzing the, the analysis kind of depends not just on looking on one block, but everything that's come before it, right? And so getting that to work properly with multiple languages, um, I think will be a real challenge. Um, uh, but, Chrissy, it would be good to conclude uh, yeah, soon, I guess. Yeah, this and actually that's, that, was my final, that was my final bullet point here. So now we're just at the thanks and um, opening for discussion. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, I guess uh, I guess in a moment we will conclude the recorded part, and then uh, I think we need to discuss some things about where we're going with the tooling situation regarding the workshops and courses and such. Um, any concluding remark by anybody before we finish this part? Um, great. And uh, so, Chris, uh, would you like to say anything uh, before we end the recording? Um, no, I, um, yeah, I, I think this is, um, yeah, I think this is pretty good. I, um, I'm excited for the next phase of things and um, to be able to start getting feedback from folks. Um, so, yeah, um, it's, it's, it's definitely my goal that Oz be something that's extensible and that you can really use in a lot of different contexts um, and that we can have a suite of tools that all kind of interoperate well with each other, not just in the Oz sphere, but that, you know, Oz play nicely with projects um, outside of that space, um, or that is to say in, in kind of the greater closure data science ecosystem. Um, and yeah, so I'm, I'm excited to chat with folks about, uh, about how we can make that uh, vision a reality.
Fantastic. Thank you so much. That was, you know, so mind opening uh, and uh, really such a beautiful discussion. And we will say goodbye to our listeners and uh, see you on the next times. <laughs>